Now, in response to Cortez murdering Velasquez's messenger, Velasquez sent local officials to arrest Cortez for acts of treason. However, that failed when Cortez offered them a share of the profits if they joined him on his crusade to Mexico. So in 1519, without official authorization, Cortez sailed from Cuba with 11 ships and over 500 men. He sailed west and landed in Cozumel, Mexico on the Yucatan coast. Now what's interesting to note is that while Cortez was not the first individual to land on Mexico, he was the first individual to come with the most advanced weaponry the world had ever seen at this particular point. And for my people at home who are pretty curious in regards to what the weapons were that Cortez actually brought, take a look. Cortez brought the most cutting edge weaponry available, including cannons. Cannons are light. They're probably not the Lombards they brought. These are falconets, light breech-loading artillery. Cannons like these were small but effective. Not only did they tear major holes in native formations, but they scared the hell out of them. They didn't have gunpowder in the New World before Cortez got there. So on the battlefield, a weapon like this was a distinct physical and psychological advantage. The conquistadors also carried a matchlock musket that shot a solid lead ball. Not very accurate, but deadly at close range. Another specialty weapon was the crossbow. Now a crossbow like this could fire a bolt out to an effective range of 100 yards or more. Cortez had special units of conquistadors who were assigned just to load these weapons. And he had other units assigned just to fire them. So armed with these new weapons, Cortez met members of the Mayan tribe who welcomed him with open arms. Although the Mayans could not speak the same language as Cortez, they were able to point Cortez in the direction of a missing Spaniard by the name of Aguilar. Now, according to Aguilar, seven years prior, Spain sent an expedition to Mexico in search of gold. Unfortunately, there was a shipwreck that killed all of the passengers, and Aguilar was the only survivor who lived among the Mayans for seven years. In addition to living with the Mayans for that long, Aguilar also let Cortez know that he was able to learn the Mayan language and would be willing to stand in as an active translator if Cortez could provide him safe passage out of Mexico. Now, it should be noted that the discovery of Aguilar ultimately tipped the scale in Cortez's favor. You see, at first, Cortez knew nothing about the Mayans, the land, the culture, or the weaponry that these people possessed. But now that he had Aguilar, who had been among them for seven years, he had a tactical advantage and knew what he was up against. So without wasting any time, Cortez asked Aguilar to debrief him in regards to what was transpiring in Mexico. It was from Aguilar that Cortez learned of Montezuma, the emperor of the Aztecs. According to Aguilar, Montezuma was the savage king who ruled all. His people feared him as a deity and common citizens were not even allowed to look him directly in the eyes. According to Aguilar, in order to conquer Mexico, Cortez himself would have to defeat Montezuma. Now, before I go any further, I want to take the opportunity to clear up a few misconceptions about the Aztec people. Now, Hollywood movies and European literature will have you believe that these individuals were nothing more than bloodthirsty savages who ate people and cut out hearts and did all of this and did all of that, but that couldn't be more further from the truth. On the contrary, the Aztec clan was way more than that. So before I go any further, I wanted to present you with a few things that you probably didn't know about the Aztec people. Now, much of what we know about the Aztecs comes from their hand-painted manuscripts and deerskin fabric weaved from agave plants. So for the sake of conversation today, I will be reviewing some of that in order to justify the validity of my claim. Number one, the Aztec Empire of 1519 was the most powerful Mesoamerican kingdom of all time. The multi-ethnic, multilingual realm stretched for more than 80,000 square miles through many parts of what is now central and southern Mexico. This enormous empire reached from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf Coast. 15 million people lived in 38 provinces and resided in more than 489 communities. They also paid tribute to their emperor, Montezuma II. Number two. Although commonly referred to as the Aztecs, a term popularized by the Europeans in the 19th century, the Aztecs never referred to themselves as Aztecs at all. In fact, they actually referred to themselves as Mexica. Spelled Mexica, not Mexica. Mexica. Three, the Aztecs or the Mexica people actually use cocoa beans or chocolate for a base of currency in their culture. Number four, 
The Aztecs followed a strict social hierarchy in which individuals were identified in three classes, nobles, commoners, or seraphs. Number five, all Aztec children attended school, though their curriculum varied by their gender and social class. The purpose of the school was to train young men in order to become warriors, and boys generally began their training at the age of 15. Noble children and exceptionally gifted commoner children attended the schools where they would receive training to become priests and government officials. Number six, the Mexica people actually had a modern day marketplace where they could sell goods and services. It was extremely busy as farmers typically sold crops here, weavers sold cloth, and merchants would sell food. On an average day, the marketplace would see about 50,000 people. Number seven, now, contrary to common belief, Christianity or Catholicism was not even the religion that the Mexico or the Aztec people originally believed. In fact, Christianity and Catholicism's roots and origins never originated in Mexico. Much like Spanish, these two religions were forced upon the native Aztecs or Mexica people. In addition, if the Spaniards never came to Mexico, Christianity and Catholicism would have never been taught to the natives. But more on Catholicism and Christianity at a later date. Now, originally, the Mexica people actually worshiped many different gods, and each of these corresponding gods represented a different part of nature or existence. You had Hiatzohipotle, who was the god of war and sacrifice. You had Quetzalcoatl, who was the god of knowledge and learning. You had Tezcatlipoca, which was the god of night. You had Zaitotec, which was the god of life and rebirth. You had Lauluk, the god of rain. And lastly, you had Chauchautle, the goddess of youth and beauty. So as you can see, the Aztecs were all an advanced civilization that was culturally developed with arts, religion, music, and crafts. To say that these individuals were anything other than that would ultimately be disingenuous and dishonest. 